premièrement un très grand merci euh, à BASI et à CityDev euh, pour cette euh, invitation. Je le considère comme un très 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 grand honneur, euh, non seulement cet espace ici, mais aussi d'être invité par ces deux organisations. Moi, je suis bruxellois d'origine et donc ça me fait double plaisir d'être réinvité dans ma ville, dans ma propre ville, en fait. Donc, euh, j'ai vécu aux États-Unis pour les 18 ans qui se sont passés. C'est pour cette raison-là que mon français a vraiment, vraiment érodé jusqu'à un niveau qui est presque pas supportable. Et c'est pour ça que je vais vous donner mon cours en anglais, puisque aussi pour les 18 ans passés, j'ai enseigné en anglais. Eh, pardon, je vais vous dire mon cours en anglais, puisque j'ai enseigné euh, en anglais les années qui sont passées. Et j'espère que vous euh, pourriez me comprendre. So, here we go. Uh, I need to start with a, a very short personal testimony, which is, uh, I, I mean, I have like 80 slides here. We will go through it very fast. Don't worry, we will just look at eye candy soon. It is, these are populist times, so I'll make it light. <laughs> But I want to tell you why I wake up in the morning. And so I wake up in the morning, uh, you know, we all have to find some way to give meaning to our lives. Um, and so one of the ways I try to give meaning is by trying to help show that also in a, a world that is democratic, in a world where for every three people you have four opinions, that it is possible to do big projects together. So that it is possible to do great projects even when we seem to disagree about pretty much everything. I've heard too many times the argument when it comes to great big projects, big city projects, big transformative projects, I've heard too much, well, if only we were in China, or if only we were ah, in Moscow, or perhaps in Singapore it could have been done already, and we just keep talking. Now, this is true, we keep talking, but, if it's, but I'm convinced that we do, not to resort, we do not need to resort to a more authoritarian model of government to do big things together. And I think the city, uh, maybe more than, uh, than our, our, our federal structure as a country, but the city is a place where we can show this uh, with actual projects on the ground. So that's why I wake up, is to show that it is possible when we all disagree, which we probably should, it's a good thing to disagree, that we still can do big things together through that disagreement. Okay, what is populism? I need to give, give a short, uh, I mean, you, you all think you know what it is, and it's, I, I kept a very simple uh, definition. It's, uh, uh, many people describe this as where we are today, where we, there's a sort of a staged conflict between the people, which are treated as a monolith, which are, are good and righteous and have a direction, and the elites, which is you, me, uh, a, a, a political, uh, a, a cultural, academic, business, you name it, elites which are only in it for their own interests and are not helping the people. This is very simply put the, the organizational logic, uh, the manichaeistic uh, logic of uh, populism. There is also another way to read it, because we can think it's very bad, we can think it's right wing. I would like to defer. I'm certainly not a populist. I'm not here to try to convince you that populism is a good thing. Please, that is not the point. I think it's deeply problematic. But there is another definition which sees the moment of populism as that which uh, sees an emancipatory social force through which marginalized groups can challenge dominant power structures. And in fact, the first time the word populism was used is in the late 19th century in Russia with the revolt of the lower middle class, the rural lower middle class, against the Tsar, against the royal house. So I would say populism pertains to, to assert pertains to a certain mode of operation. It's not in itself left-wing or right-wing or progressive or conservative. It is a, it is a, a mode of, of organizing a disagreement between the so-called people and the so-called elite. Of course, it's extremely dangerous uh, because there is a risk here. And the risk is uh, that you get the tyranny of some of a majority and you risk really eroding values such as openness, pluralism, diversity. Uh, these things are uh, at risk in a populist moment, and we can feel it every day. I mean, I work, uh, as you know, also in the United States. We've seen what happens uh, in, in the UK, etc. But maybe it's not all bad. Maybe we can try to make the best out of it. We can try to do something useful with this in this moment. Uh, 
I was speaking to the Administrateur General de City Devi a moment, and, and we were talking about, uh, I, I did a, a, a doctorate, a PhD, uh, this is a while ago, but I did investigations on a number of people, Cert, uh, José Luis Cert, Lucan, uh, Sigrid Gideon, Ernst Kassir, uh, Ortega y Gasset, liberal philosophers and architects and urban planners that had to run away, leave Europe in the early 30s because of the uh, barbarism uh, in Europe. And what they did is they left, and through various ways, through Sweden, England, etc., they all ended up in, in, the, in Cambridge, in, in the United States. They all participated in a reflection, like what the hell did we do wrong? How could we have, from our viewpoint of our discipline, how could we have helped turn the tide? You know, when, uh, when Hitler had Speer and when Stalin had Iofan, they had their architects, they had a very totalitarian aesthetic, a political aesthetic. Why did we not win the battle for the hearts and minds with our great progressive modernist project? They lost. They had to retreat and went into this mode of reflection. And so one of the things that they came up with is um, we need to build monuments, we need to, do, we need to organize populist propaganda for the open society. <laughs> We need to actually really fight with the same uh, means. Uh, we need to be as, as propagandistic, as populist, as direct, as vulgar uh, as our opponents, uh, but for a good cause. This is what, this is what they uh, uh, were after. So I would argue that they were trying to produce through their own fields, architecture, urban planning, urbanism, populist templates, templates to support and provide propaganda even for open societies. The simplistic diagram that I can show you here, that in, in, at least in my estimation, summarizes that moment, late 30s, early 40s, uh, in exile, you know, Europeans in exile, is this sketch from the, let's say, the authoritarian model. I mean, yeah, if you want to, you can see the uh, Palais de Justice, <laughs> but really it's a sketch of the Soviet palace, and you see the same model in any authoritarian uh, structure, this kind of ziggurat, uh, with a, sing a singularity at the top and everything else sucked into it from the bottom. Cut this into pieces and throw the loose elements on the platform as um, each monument screaming into the emptiness its own value, never reconciled with each other, never in synthesis, but nevertheless in a much greater stage of openness where public space, our space, exists between these screams, between these disagreements. This was their idea, this in a sense, in a simplistic way, their diagram. We need to you know, cut up that authoritarian model and replace it by a much more open one. And then build uh, an apparatus of uh, almost populist propaganda for it. So I, I really liked this, uh, this uh, historical moment. Of course, the tools of today will need to be very different from the tools of back then. And I think my, for me, the lecture, in a way, is an attempt to help redefine some tools for our current populist moment. So, I mean, we can learn from these people. It is almost 100, well, 80 years ago. Uh, how shall we deal with our own populist moment, which is also fraught with danger and risk? So, I want to basically uh, present to you four tools and techniques to deal with, popu uh, to address our populist moment. Uh, tools that we basically do change, I, th I think, some of the conventions of how we think of architecture or how we think of urbanism, uh, or at least how we have thought about it for the last uh, few uh, well, um, decades. And it's built around a series of inabilities. I mean, we can only understand populism as being the result of a problem, right? I mean, people are only going into these kind of conspiratorial mindsets when they are feeling completely disconnected, which means they're suffering from basic psychiatric inabilities, incapabilities. There's something they can't do anymore. And these are inabilities to, let's say, read. They cannot read their environment anymore. People are unable to understand which broader whole they belong to. There's an inability to relate. People are no longer able to, to relate to that. So not only can't they read it, perhaps they can also just not relate to that environment anymore let alone that they could recognize themselves in it. They can find a way to actually uh, uh, yeah, build, a, build a, a strong relation with it. And finally, what they really mostly ever, never ever can do in a populist era is this, they lost the sense that they can shape their world. 
I can no longer shape the world around me, therefore I am powerless and frustrated, and these damn elites are to blame for it. So these are four inabilities that I think, now I'm not talking about uh, collective psychiatry, but really about urbanism. We can do something about this. We can work with reading your environment. We can make our cities more legible. We can make, we can make more places where uh, uh, different groups of people can relate. This is why the first workshop or the first class is organized on legibility on a regional scale, uh, lisibilité, legibility not on the scale of the neighborhood, but on the larger scale. Um, the neighborhood is fine. Relating to each other, so for instance, uh, is it possible to make classes of people coexist that, uh, and live together and recognize each other that today don't really do that? Specifically by mixing industry and city, like industrial activity and urban programs, something that I know CityDev is very much engaged with. Third, to recognize and to, can we actually build other levels of seeing oneself in the, in the world built around oneself? And finally, uh, rethinking the role of a designer, right? to co-creation, curatorship, etc. These four are elaborated by the, uh, the experts that uh, the, the vice rector was uh, explaining uh, in, the, in four consecutive. But I will go through them somewhat more briefly with each of you to, so you get a sense. And I will need to say one more thing before we go into each of those four, let's say, tools or techniques in the era of populism to address these inabilities of, of, of large groups of people lost and searching for a purpose. Uh, it is the need, and we all, I mean, we all know that we need some big projects in our cities. Climate change is happening, inequality is happening. There are big risks, and we will not tackle them by thinking small. As an example, this is a 2016 risk dashboard of uh, the Davos World Economic Forum, and I just highlighted the things that urbanism and design can actually help do something about. So, I mean, these are all the big disasters that can happen the likelihood of a disaster occurring with the impact should it occur. And then, you know, are the projects where we can make a difference. And climate change, of course, is, is, uh, is, is up here. Viruses could be somewhere up here. Uh, but, you know, climate change, we can do something about. Um, and these big transformative projects can only be built if we actually get things done. You know, we, it, it would be wrong to assume that we need to resort to an authoritarian model of government in order to arm ourselves against these risks. But I see many people think that way, and this is a real problem. So how can we get these big projects done to arm ourselves, to protect ourselves, to deal with these challenges, and not fall into the trap of an authoritarian way of thinking? Certainly in a populist era, I think this is a huge, uh, a huge thing. Well, I mean, if we want to not fall in that trap, we must get these projects built. And we cannot discuss for 20, 30 years, we actually need to build them. Now, if you look at the big, big transformative projects that you can see happen in cities, two out of three, two out of three fail. By fail, I mean never get built. And they mostly fail, I mean, you can do the statistics, you know, in, in our country, do, do, we do two or three big projects every decade, but over the world, there's a few hundreds, so you can do the statistics. They fail mostly because we have not properly dealt with certain obstacles. So we're fine. I mean, we can, certainly in our country and in the West, typically, we can deal with the financial obstacles, we can run the numbers, we can do the financial analysis. We can certainly also, even though it's complicated, deal with the purely technical engineering obstacles. That's fine too. But these two out of three failures is because some obstacles simply never registered, like we never actually saw them, and so we bumped into it and collapsed. And these are spatial and social obstacles. And by spatial obstacles, I mean, let's say you build a highway, you never thought of all the side effects it would bring, all the people that would be damaged, whose properties would be damaged, whose neighborhoods would be uh, uh, having less air quality, more noise, etc. These are uh, spatial obstacles. You don't think of the side effects. Or you find a big transformative project, it benefits a certain group, it disadvantages another. Well, it can never happen. In a democracy, you need to make your big projects benefit uh, 80 to 85 percent of the people. So you need to restructure them so they're multi-purpose, multifunctional, and everybody benefits. And there's a plurality, a plurality of audiences serviced. 
and this is, brings me to the other obstacle, which is social obstacles, which is that we, can, we are unable, I mean, I am unable, and I would say, dare to say that you also are unable to think of what these benefits should be, because we are, we are as experts, or as governing, or as members of the expert class or the governing class, we are unable to understand what truly will give uh, pride and happiness to locals. So we need to engage with them and find out what it is that they need in a project in order to make it theirs, so they can also shape it and, and make it theirs. So those are the obstacles why projects fail, so we, can, we need to deal with that. Excuse me. And so, uh, I will go now into these four modes, but just so you know, we have an organization, we have about 50 people uh, in Brussels and almost five in New York City. Uh, and in Brussels, we're at the Chaos au Charbonnage, uh, just across from, from the Le Petit uh, Klein Castelche, Petit Chateau. And so uh, we really need uh, at least six or seven more great people to join us, and I can't find them. So I'm about to go into the Petit Chateau and just take anybody. So please, <laughs> if there's people that want to come work for us uh, any time of day, uh, give me a call. We, we're welcome to have you. I'm sorry, I had to mention this really quickly. Um, but we have a number of professors, academics, PhDs. We want to really do really good work in different places in the world. And so the offices are in these two locations. We try to work mostly in Northwest Europe, this part of the East Coast, or Sub-Saharan Africa. And all the other locations we no longer do, just because you cannot be good at everything and you cannot know everything. All right. So the project that I'm now going to show are largely done with this group of people, with this partnership, uh, uh, with many, many great experts, which is again why I'm very happy that in the next sessions you will meet some of these people directly. <clears throat> Legibility on a regional scale is about how we understand ourselves as part of a larger whole. If, you know, in a populist era, if we fall apart as a society, the local connections stay they stay the longest. It's the larger connections on a larger scale that we lose. But nevertheless, uh, it is possible and it should be possible to do large scale projects that help reinstate an understanding and even a physical legibility of what we belong to. I want to give you an example uh, of a project we just finished. This is in New York City, but in fact it's bigger than New York City. So this is Manhattan. And the city of New York is more or less uh, this. But you see, this is a much bigger area. This includes the states of uh, the state of New York, the state of Connecticut, and the state of New Jersey. And we have the whole metropolitan area, including all of Long Island, at 12 and a half million people. Yeah, this, so this is actually more people than Belgium. But it's, uh, we, we, we did a project for the RPA, Regional Plan Association. And the RPA is an organization that um, is built out of civic action committees, so people, citizens, and developers, investors, with some support for, by governments. But it's the one organization that transcends all layers of government, because you have three states, you have, I don't know, eight counties, a number of cities and towns. They try to work on urbanism across scales, across all the scales, and then get these projects, get a, build a plan, and then get the plan adopted by the local uh, towns and, and councils. The plan that they do is very uh, irregular. So once every 25 years, they make a big plan. So this is now their fourth plan. So this, uh, they exist for about 100 years. And in the fourth plan, we've done it. So I'm very proud that we were able to be the, the author for this plan. But what you see, it is a system built around a series of, of uh, uh, old and uh, also futuristic transportation corridors. So uh, of course, subways and trains but also uh, more contemporary forms of infrastructure, uh, rapid on-demand transit. Um, you know, there is a revolution ongoing in mobility and sharing systems for mobility. So it's also working on those. You have these networks, and whenever there's intersections of networks, you get moments of, of uh, potential densification. And when you have a moment of potential densification, this is your chance to build city. Because make no mistake, you might think that all of this looks like Manhattan, but nothing is farther from the truth. Only Manhattan looks like Manhattan, and all the rest looks like shit. <laughs> all the rest is, very, is, is mostly problematic. 
So we, we, we worked on this plan and now we're working a bit also for the new uh, technologies for transportation. We're working with, uh, with sidewalk labs. Um, and this is <clears throat> most of what, what that area looks like. This is most of that uh, metropolitan area. Uh, and so when we have these intersections, we can try to go to a next level of quality uh, and sharing. But so that is actually, to me, a, a, a way of organizing thinking and organizing interventions to address the large scale and legibility on the large scale. In a simple diagram, you set up a larger network with clear nodes. Each node is built with a shared and understood language of, uh, of, uh, of objects, and you can even theorize a single specific architectural intervention in those. That's one, one toolbox for legibility. Another one could be to think about larger continuities. This is a project that we've done in Ghent and also a bit in Rotterdam. Larger continuities in areas that are completely chaotic and dispersed, well, just pull out the red carpet, you know, a simple red carpet, very flexible, very easy to organize, in a sense, no big pressures, but able to bring together completely uh, fragmented and dispersed environments. Um, in Rotterdam, uh, and then I want to show you one case study in a... I'll come back to the Antwerp project because we've spent a lot of time on it recently. Uh, but in Antwerp, where you have the ring... Now, I need to tell you, for the ring around Antwerp, it's not like the ring around Brussels. Like the, uh, the ring around Antwerp is really close to the city. It's like La Moyenne in Brussels. So it's like uh, Boulevard Lambermont and Cette Echelle. That's where the ring in Antwerp is. So it's surrounded by city on the in and the outside. Now, there is a piece which still has greenery, then there is a piece here which has nothing. Um, and so, and that piece which is now in the middle of the most poor, destitute districts of, of Antwerp, where this is where poverty has always resided, because this is where for our next, for the last, sorry, for the last 200 years, all the big infrastructures were thrown here. Les abattoirs of, 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 of Antwerp, uh, railroad yards, uh, industrial, uh, noxious problem, problematic, all, everything was here. Also the highway. And so the, the notion of making a project where you actually work on two great continuities. One, that one piece which did not have green, which was not parked, to make it continuous. And on the other hand, use that here is a highway here, but it's buried to use that project to actually uh, now stitch together and provide lateral transversal continuities, which are equally important. But so that way, a scheme that starts on this scale, and this is 17, 18 kilometers, right, with a, with a big missing piece, you, can, you work it through as a continuity, or as a problem of continuity and legibility, and you go to ever smaller scales until you arrive at the scale of, of literally the joints of the elements in the tunnel that are also elements constitutive of the landscape, then I think you're addressing the problem of continuity. So it's really all the scales of the very large scale down to the very small scale uh, to, to actually relate those uh, in order to provide that larger legibility. The second... The second, uh, and I will go a little faster, uh, but the second uh, problem is our inability to relate to each other. I mean, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, in, in a society where inequality is growing fast, to even know what other kinds of people exist. Uh, there is a project which I think is very strong here in Brussels, and I always advertise it elsewhere, uh, because it's very radical. It's to reintroduce uh, uh, industrial use in urban context. I mean, it's not easy but it's, I think, a very powerful idea. You should know that, for those of you that are not urban planners, for the last hundred years, we had decided that city and industry should never coexist. In fact, the very idea of urban planning is built on cutting the, red, the link. Industry somewhere else as living because of the, you know, the fumes and noxious uses and health issues, etc. So for us to now say, well, we can bring it back together is a bold idea. The, the relation to populism for me is that, of course, it brings factory workers of a new generation together with people that live and that might have other, be in other income classes. There is no way in which different income classes will really coexist unless if you make them do it through work environments. Um, we tested in Boston, where I, where I spend a lot of my time, uh, a lot of the new small factories, so small companies that produce things with the robots and, and, uh, and so forth. They're in the middle of the city. So this is all really city. 
a lot of the, the spin-offs from MIT that make things, make industry, are now in cities. So reality has bypassed the old dogma of separation. And we can really go quite far with that. Uh, so we worked in, again in the US on, on various contexts. Of course, typically, industrial uses are, and or have been, also for the last 100 years, in horizontal, overwhelmingly horizontal environments. And this, this can no longer be the case when we build in cities, because the, the land value is simply too high. Uh, for me, the most radical project we've ever done was in the, in the Brooklyn Navy Yards, which is here, this is Manhattan. Uh, and the Brooklyn Navy Yards is a, basically owned by the city, the city of New York. It's an economic development agency. And they really wanted uh, 25,000 uh, jobs for factory workers in this area. So not maximum revenue for real estate, but maximum blue-collar jobs. And so we had to start stacking factories vertically in order to make the number happen. And so we spent a lot of time trying to see how you can actually go from a horizontal model to a vertical stackings. It's not evident, but it's possible. And around the same time, Brussels was engaging on this big, bold vision, not just for a build Qualitätsplan for the Zone du Canal, but also to really, before that already, CityDev with the project of uh, mixing industry and city, um, and, and, and let's say regular development. Um, it is very useful that the, re that the region has organized, and we were happy to win the competition, um, the, uh, a, com a request for a plan d'image de qualité, a built qualitätsplan for the whole canal zone. I will not go into much detail about it here, because many of you know about this, um, but it, it deals on the one hand with the large continuities. And I do think the zone du canal is extremely interesting. It is 14 kilometers long, and it is the single biggest figure that Brussels has. Not, I mean, forget Leopold II, it is miniature compared to the order and the structure of the zone du canal. Uh, of course, there are different and different neighborhoods and different zones, there are singularities, there's many things, many detail and many refinement to add. Uh, but there is now a sort of a coherent vision for the organization of public space in all of this, uh, all of this zone. Which is interesting because in the most segments, so this is uh, the downtown area, the Pentagon, but most areas north and south historically were industry. And in the future, again, should be or would be a mixture of industry and city. So you, you might know this project, Laboratoire. On the left, you see as it was. On the right, you see the mass one that we made, uh, which is a large plaza surrounded by six or seven semi industrial blocks um, with a mixture of urban and industrial uses, of which the one on the left uh, has been built, has been realized. The idea here was, in order to allow for industry to happen, is we went back to a painting from uh, Malevich uh, called White Square on White, uh, to actually really organize both the, the, the central square as the white square, on also an equally white background of generic buildings. Buildings without particular content, without particular idea, that could be programmed to have anything, and certainly also uh, industry. Uh, this one building has been realized. Um, it was also awarded some uh, recognition at the Venice Biennale, and so we rebuilt a portion of the abattoir in Brussels in Venice, uh, in better times in Venice. And uh, you see here the pieces of the abattoir uh, ready to be mounted uh, near the San Marco. But this is the Brussels one. And so the idea was, if you do an industrial project, there are moments of transaction between different classes, and certainly Les marchés, de, uh, les marchés de l'abattoir offer that as well. You know, mixing classes, different kinds of people. It can be a very short moment that we coexist. I buy a melon from you and you offer me the melon for two euros and I say one and a half. And we spend 30 seconds discussing and then the transaction occurs. That, that particular little moment, that little ritual is what we need to, uh, uh, in a sense, make, make sacred. So that's why these things... We need to be generous and celebrate that moment and make that the moment of coexistence and provide the architectural backdrop uh, to, celebrate, uh, to celebrate it. On the, on the higher level, there is, a, on, in the meantime, a big urban farm, the largest one currently in operation in Brussels. And some shots from Venice. But the, uh, as we made the build Qualitätsplan, the, the large plan for a visual structuring order for the Zone du Canal, of course, it's funny, it somehow has to end somewhere. And in the north, it ends, of course, in the south as well, it, it ends, the region ends and then Flanders begins. 
so it was funny that we got around the same time a mission from the town of Machelen uh, to work on the Flemish side. And so we've been trying to extend basically the system uh, of the build quality one in Flanders over Machelen and Vilvoorde. The reason we were asked there is for a project that you might have heard of. It's called Uplace, uh, which was a, a, a big idea for a shopping mall that is no longer uh, 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 active, but where the owner wants a new project and the city and the, this whole area, which has exactly the same conditions as Brussels, um, also really needs the employment. So this is uh, the order of the project as it is in, the, in Brussels, and this is the project of, let's say, formerly U Place. I shouldn't be showing it to you, but I couldn't help. Uh, it's a very simple project based on a series of big halls. Uh, pensez à uh, Tour et Taxi. Big halls, uh, the 21st century version of Tour et Taxi. So this is just a quick view, but okay, onward to the next project, uh, which is to, for City Dev. And for CityDev, there was a competition called uh, Petite Ile, uh, uh, CityGate. And uh, there was a team of architects, and our office was one of them. And the client asked for a, uh, a, a building with multiple uses, including industry. So we designed a floor plate that is uh, in itself uh, un uh, completely generic, complete in platform uh, without definition so that you could, m you could move almost any combination of uses and functions into it. It means you have to make everything higher and broader than it should be. So 10% over-dimensioning, double access rules, a number of things. Uh, and then with the, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, so, it, bâtiment à affectation multiple. And so I think that's also a potential answer. These super generic, simplistic exoskeletons uh, of this, of which this is one uh, one example, and I think this is going under construction very soon if it hasn't started yet. Another project where where we had to spend a lot of time working on the, on various um, uh, uh, so there's lots of contradictions. If you want to make industry and city coexist, it's it's actually very difficult. Here we had uh, one plateau of industry. And then on top of it, uh, a completely separate level of city, of people living and gardens, etc. And so I gotta say, uh, the only place where we're able to organize coexistence, I'm sorry, I'm going back to the plan, the only place, but I think this is a success, is here. In these lobbies, of, oh, sorry, these three lobbies. So these are lobbies where the public, the street, la ville, can uh, look in, and where people that live upstairs go in, but also the whole industrial world inside uh, looks out. And you see that in these, these views. So this is the, the, the lobby from inside, the industrial intestines of the project, and this is the lobby from outside. So the, to organize coexistence of industry and city means you have to get uh, fumes, noxious uses, s uh, lots of noise, lots of dirt, in an environment where kids are playing and families are living. It's not a piece of cake. There's nothing romantic about it. It's ugly, it's nasty, it's hideous, but it's for a good cause. <laughs> but it means you need to really work, work it through and you need to separate a lot in order to be able to uh, reorganize it together. I want to ask uh, uh, the director for BSC if I, I'm going a little bit over time. Um, uh, do, do I have your permission to go a little bit longer? Yeah. Who, who feels I should end within the next minute? You can say so, it's fine. Uh, okay. So I will go very fast through this one, but I think it's actually extremely important. I will, I will cut through the, the, the third um, uh, recipe, uh, which has to do with our inability to recognize. I want to show you just this project, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep it at it. This is very short. The police station in Brakel. Brakel is a town, uh, well, uh, somewhere. <laughs> uh, um, with a very good mayor. And this is the police station, and we, were, we, we like architecture to be somewhat direct in your face, perhaps a little bit brutal, but it's very strange when you do that with the function or the program of the police, because the police is the one program that is endowed with the authority to use violence. They can use violence against you, they can violate your body. So we, 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 it was also, we, have to, we felt we have to be humorous and in a sense laugh with that a little bit. Laugh respectfully, but not entirely. So we built an army of policemen 
uh, about uh, uh, 23, and they're uh, five meters tall, uh, and they support the, the police station. It's extremely kitsch. It's extremely over the edge, and it, this is exactly the reason why we did it. And in fact, we're in good company because this has been done for 3,000 years, right? Uh, but here you see them, the, the, you know, uh, uh, la police flamande en garde. Uh, uh, and you see the, the size difference. And so actually, this is perfectly possible now. So, I mean, for me, this is not an innocent point. Yes, we use it here somewhat to the smile, but in fact, current modes of production, the way we can build today, we have gained, or we are gaining new form freedom. Why are we still building in strict rectangular structures when in fact we have construction mechanisms that allow us a complete much wider set of form freedoms? We should use these form freedoms to build a city and to build a, an, a, a populist aesthetic that allows people to recognize themselves, sometimes quite literally, uh, in, uh, in uh, andro androgynous forms or, uh, or, or uh, anthropomorphic forms. Okay, I'm cutting through this. Finally, the last point about Antwerp and about especially our inability to shape. So I, I'm mostly known in Flanders because of a, a project in Antwerp that involved a lot of uh, collaboration with citizens. I believe in that. Uh, but it's not always evident and it's certainly not the only thing we do. But just so to give you a quick background, I need to go quite fast on this, but nevertheless. The, the story in Antwerp is a story that has been going on for almost 30 years. So in 1996, the Flemish government decided they wanted to close the ring. So that this piece of ring does not exist. Here you go to Holland, here you go to Bruges and Ghent, and here you go to Brussels. They wanted to close it. They wanted to close it with a big bridge, and the big bridge would have all sorts of noxious side effects, fumes, plumes, uh, there was people living here, of course. This was port, but about to become an airline, the most fancy district uh, in the north of Antwerp. They were going to destroy forests, etc. They were trying to do this. Nobody in Antwerp wanted it, but they were pushing through from top down. In the meantime, the next move was by 2004. A local action committee said, well, yeah, we don't really care about this, but how about if we actually were to cover the ring? Because there is Borgeraut, one of the dense, most densest neighborhoods in Belgium, it has no park, there is a park here. If we can cross, we could get there. So these were the two opening moves. And so uh, one of the tools we had to use there in when you start to work together with people, let people shape their own environment, is uh, there was, a, first of all, build knowledge together. And there's, there's so much fake news. There's so much false advertisements, false truths out there. It's impossible to tell people they're wrong because nobody buys an authority argument anymore. So you have to learn together. So the first thing we did was build, in a sense, a public university. Uh, and in this public university against fake news, we realized we had to bring all these disciplines together because we had discussions about traffic. I mean, I'm, I'm not a traffic expert. We had big discussions about where should the ring go? Should it close like here or there or somewhere else? In the meantime, it was, a, it was completely a communications disaster with a referendum, a public uh, a polling, and increasingly people were arguing for covering the ring and building parks. But if you add these up, you see, I mean, you need so much knowledge to do any one of these right individually not to mention all of them together. So it requires an enormous effort at interdisciplinary knowledge building. Our, our political leadership, whether I think, believe it's in Brussels or, or Flanders, actually doesn't matter. Our political leadership needs knowledge at the intersection of these fields, and they don't get it. They get knowledge from one expert or one consultancy, and we need to mix, we need to intersection. So we built a sort of a public university, worked with lots of these experts, had over hundreds of workshops where we drew and calculated in large groups, tried to get the effects of air quality on tunnel safety, on mobility, on the modal shift, um, and, and worked on this, as I said, for, for several years. Um, with, I must say, uh, to some, in, in some way also results. But we got, yeah, we had uh, hundreds of workshops, lots of uh, simultaneous calculation systems. And then when we had the first a series of objects, a sort of ambitions note, uh, we were able to go public, and thankfully, and I think this is very important, think of a grand projet that we want to maybe do in Brussels, 
we had support of, of majority and opposition in the parliament. And I think this is really key because you have the big projects, they last two, three, four uh, legislatures. So by definition, will every uh, political party be uh, engaged with it? So if the project has a color, it's dead. It's dead. It cannot be a green or a yellow or a blue or a red project. It has to be a project with 80% support. Uh, so this was for me, the one, the, the, in a sense, the biggest victory or the biggest uh, moment of happiness was when we got uh, opposition and majority support in, uh, uh, in the Flemish parliament. We engaged with the people, you see the people here, uh, uh, in, in many, many ways, with exhibitions, with interactive uh, shows. Um, and we learned to let go. I mean, in this big project, we cannot control. So the fourth and the last session, which will be uh, taught by Marcel Smets, is in fact about this, is about curatorship. So I'm certainly not inventing all of this, and this is not something we uh, have done alone. But if you look at Antwerp, uh, we have a piece that's under construction, we have a piece that was basic design, a research phase, and one which we're going to start construction this year. But the entire ring will be tackled. Uh, this in itself is about 5.5 billion, and uh, this will be, this, hasn't, this is 300 million, and this doesn't have funding yet. But so things are in different speeds, but you have to keep this whole thing afloat and every month make it better. So this is very important to understand. This is not a project where you, you make a drawing like a building and then it's done and you go to building permit. No, you go to first building permit, then a second, then a third, then a fourth. You keep improving. This whole thing takes 10 years. This is a master plan, but it's a dynamic master plan. So every six months we update it. New knowledge, new insights. Something that I think is very important, uh, and I know I need to uh, wrap it up relatively soon, and I have just a few slides left, uh, in this kind of very distributed power situation. So Belgium, also Flanders, also Holland, I mean, we, all of us here, we have really a distributed power situation. So top down, I know one thing, it never works. I mean, I've seen it in Antwerp, 30 years of pushing top down for the ring, it never happened. Only once we started building knowledge together and creating a new project together, which brought benefits to the locals as well as to the region, were we able to come up with something. So top-down really, through our constitutional order and our legal apparatus, we have organized a society where nobody can push things through anymore. It's good or bad, but it's what it is. So you can only build large coalitions to get anything done. But when you build large coalitions, you have to convince people that it's in their interest to step into a coalition. So I used a lot, we use a lot of game theory. I know, do you know game theory? It's basically, it gives, you in, it gives you an insight into distributed power situations. So we go to every possible decision by every possible player in a sequence and you come up with a thousand or more possible outcomes. You know, the, the game can be played, every possible decision is being taken, you come up with thousands of outcomes. And of these thousands of outcomes, you know, this goes on until we're like far beyond the basement, of these thousands of outcomes, there's four in Antwerp. There were four good ones. Four ones where everybody wins. And 96, uh, uh, you know, 9,900, uh, uh, where everybody loses. So finding the few outcomes where everybody wins and then dialing back, you know, okay, so what does it mean? Who has to decide what at which moment so we end up with a, a beneficial? Doing this has been incredibly pedagogical, both for me, but also for all the players, for all the 12 to 15 players there, to actually dial back and understand the actual power structure, which is counterintuitive. And then I cannot repeat enough that, I mean, what was nice in Antwerp is that, you, of course, as you know, there is an, uh, 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 an NVR uh, government in, in Antwerp, and of course, the, the civic action committees are, are plutôt progressif, eh? are rather on the progressive side. So we have a conservative government and a progressive uh, 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 social field, and they were able to make a deal together. Uh, and I think this was, uh, this, uh, um, when you make that kind of a deal with that kind of 80%, you can speak about a covenant for the future of a region. Um, and uh, in this case, the deal was, uh, well, uh, uh, encompassed many, many things. Closing the ring, which we had been fighting, fought about for 30 years, but finally closing it, building a roof over it, uh, doing a bypass in the north, and also getting 50 uh, out of every uh, 100 movements to be done without private vehicles, so re realizing a modal shift uh, in the region. 
all this through a sort of sustained structural collaboration between citizens, experts, and administrators. And that's the model that we're working on now, and I think it, it actually really, really works. Because we meet all the conflict in the beginning. We see all the fights in the beginning. We don't spend 10 million and, and five years of 10 years of work and then end and have, not, have missed a critical obstacle. We see them right away. Uh, and so, yeah, you, here you see the leader of the most important action committee, uh, and then, the, of course, uh, uh, the uh, bourgeois. So, the, when it was clear we were going to get the deal, we went to the, the Orthodox district in Antwerp and asked a friend to make a nice rings. There's 12 rings, we say, it's a signatory of the covenant for the future of Antwerp. And the, all the people that signed have a ring like that. And now this is the way we work. Uh, and so we're still active there to help curate this model. Yellow are, let's say, the administrations, blue are the citizens, and red are the experts. It doesn't matter which color is which, but they're mixed. So everything is in a pretty transparent process. We have offices in the neighborhoods, uh, really, uh, so, to, so that people can really actively co-shape the new ring. There's a, a sustained campaign of uh, ring bowers, eh? so ring builders. We use design, in a sense, as a form of diplomacy. I showed you some of these drawings. We have five or six big design teams that are working on some of these projects. But you know, this is, this is what, a, what the ring looks like, or this. This is what the highway project for, this is the biggest regional landscape park west of the city, but it's built into a highway project. Uh, so I'm concluding, but we finally, we had like all these teams over the entire ring work on projects and combine up to make about 30 projects for 3 billion euro. And then we checked all the possible combinations of these projects, Detroit projects, and had evaluated which ones were uh, the most useful. And those are now being built. And that's what we're, uh, what we're still working on in, in Antwerp. Um, finally, last note on Antwerp, but on any of these projects, you have to write history together. I mean, this is when you do a big project for a big group of people, they all have to come outside of their comfort zone and they have to feel like they're really uh, uh, conquering old ghosts. They're stepping into a future. For Antwerp, it was very nice. I don't know, I know we're all from Brussels here, but this is, you see, tu vois, vive les gueux. This is a battle, this is a representation of the battle at Osterweil. And Osterweil is a place where the ring is being closed, completed. And this battle was invoked by both uh, Meer de Wever and by uh, Wim van Hees, the most important civic action committee leader. Why? They both said this was a battle Antwerp lost. Uh, so in, in other words, the Spanish Inquisition came, the Spanish conquered Antwerp, and all free thinkers, Protestants, Jews and others had to leave the city, and Flanders became Catholic. So we lost that battle. But this battle, this battle today for Osterville, this time we've won. We've won against our old demons and our old ghosts, and we've, uh, we've found an agreement uh, across uh, huge uh, uh, conflicts of opinion and differences in, uh, in appreciation. So um, I thought it was a very nice uh, way to, to end my presentation to you. Uh, just this last thing. Uh, for me, the big takeaway of what we've learned so far, and this is certainly true in the age of populism, uh, that a plan where urbanists, you think of us as technical people, forget it. Uh, we're making a social contract in your service. We make an agreement between uh, the public and its various uh, uh, audiences and its representatives about the direction of a joint future. So yes, a plan is also a blueprint and something to build. But I would argue with you that first and foremost, it is a, a contrat social. Uh, thank you so much for your patience and enduring tolerance.